Hello, my name's Kit Barker. I'm a professor at the University of Queensland, and I'm here to tell you a second story about the case of Donoghue and Stevenson. Uh, this is the second in, or the second in a series of uh, three little video clips that you'll be getting about the case. Uh, the first one uh, was describing the history and the context and the facts of the case. That fateful day in 1928 when Mrs. Donoghue was sitting in a cafe in Paisley in Glasgow having her, or allegedly, um, having her um, ice cream float with ginger beer manufactured by the defendant. Uh, the third of the little video clips is going to tell you a bit about uh, an updated version of how the law regards products liability in the modern day. Uh, so products liability has moved on from the day of Donoghue and Stevenson, and particularly in the 1950s and the 1960s, this became a very live issue on account of some cases known as the thalidomide cases involving drugs produced by drug manufacturers that caused horrendous abnormalities in children. This one is really about Lord uh, Atkins' contribution to legal reasoning. So the case of Donoghue and Stevenson from this point of view is about more than just the outcome of the case. It's about what Lord Atkin taught us about how to reason in law. So, think about the situation that Lord Atkin was in uh, in the, those fateful days in 1932. How was he to decide the principal question of when or whether a manufacturer owed a duty of care to an ultimate consumer of one of its products? Unfortunately for Lord Atkin, the law was not very sophisticated in this regard when it came to legal reasoning. This was really how courts approached the decision, or decisions of this type, towards the end of the 19th century. They didn't have a general conception of how to answer this question. All they had were a variety of different categories of case in which courts had held on one occasion or another that one person would owe a duty of care to another. A couple of examples of these that you might think were sort of relevant to our situation were cases where people produced or sold things that were dangerous in themselves, so explosives, for example, or poisons, which they could really pretty easily foresee were likely to cause harm to those who ultimately by, might misuse them or be injured by them. The second category uh, were a category of case involving things that were not necessarily dangerous in themselves, but which the producer or the seller of them knew to be dangerous. So there was one case from the uh, 1800s in which uh, a man sold a gun uh, to another man for the use of his son, knowing perfectly well that this gun uh, was not as it was represented to be safe and of good quality, but was dangerous. The gun blew up in the son's hand, the son's hand was injured, and the court in that particular instance had found that a duty of care was owed uh, by the seller of the gun to the son. So. How, then, is a court to decide a new case? Something falling out once out, outside one of these little categories, when the law of tort is primordial in this way, undeveloped, just a heap of particular instances. Lord Gatkin's idea was this. He thought that there must be some golden thread, some common principle underlying the existing cases, depicted here by this little circle through the range of particularities. And he thought that if one was able to extract a common principle from the various different instances, that one could then use this common principle to help decide the novel case. This common principle, and we'll talk about this in just a second, uh, is now commonly referred to as the neighbour principle. Now, um, you might want to contrast Lord Atkins' reasoning here when you come to read the case, if you do read the case, uh, with the reasoning of Lord Macmillan on the one hand and a dissenting judge, Lord Buckmaster, on the other. So Lord Buckmaster just looked at all those particular instances, previous decisions, and decided that looking at those decisions, there was really nothing that could be done for the plaintiff on the facts of the case. There was no further general principle that could be used to help her in, in getting a successful claim. Uh, Lord Macmillan, on the other hand, he was uh, one of the judges that did think that she should be entitled to claim, uh, allowed the claim, um, didn't ever rule out uh, the possibility of new categories of case opening up in which duties of care would be owed, and thought that this was one of them, but didn't try to extract any general principle from the cases that might be useful to judges in the future. So, what was Lord Atkin's neighbour principle? 
This is it. The rule he said that you're to love your neighbour, this is a religious principle, becomes in law you must take reasonable care to avoid acts and omissions which you can reasonably foresee will be likely to injure your neighbour. He then asks the question, well, who in law is my neighbour? And the answer he gives, people who are so closely and directly affected by my actions that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation. So that's a little bit from his judgment, but if we step back from this, what are the principal ideas behind it? What are the elements of the legal principle that he's going to use to help him to decide the case? First is the idea that a manufacturer or other person has a degree of foresight, is able to foresee the consequences of their actions upon others. The second is the idea that not everybody to whom I foresee injury is necessarily owed a duty of care by me, only those who are closely and directly affected by what I do. Uh, and this concept has subsequently been known in the case law as the concept of proximity. So duties of care in general arise in circumstances in which I am able to foresee injury to people with, in respect of whom I'm in a proximate relationship. So what can we say about Lord Atkins' neighbour principle? What was it and what wasn't it, perhaps equally importantly? Well, it was clearly a principle founded in a moral code. The moral code in question for Lord Atkin was his own set of religious beliefs, but he thought that these beliefs were commonly shared by society. So the neighbour principle in that sense resided within a social moral framework. Clearly also, it was more than just a moral principle. It was a principle of law. Why was it a principle of law? Because it was extracted from these particular instances in which duties of care had been found to be owed. In other words, it was something that we could find in the existing law, not just in moral codes. Thirdly, and importantly, and this point is quite often misunderstood, I think, he regarded it as an interpretive principle, that is, as a tool for understanding existing material. He described it as a, as a general conception of the sorts of relationships that give rise to duties of care in the law of negligence. So, here, the principle that he uses, the neighbour principle, is designed to enable him to attain a greater understanding of the legal world, a greater understanding of the context in which uh, these particular instances of legal decision making have been made. Finally, well, what was the purpose of having this interpretive principle? To help him and to help future judges in future cases to decide uh, whether or not duties of care should be owed in unforeseen circumstances, in additional new cases. So uh, think back to the prime, previous primordial state of tort law, that series of mere particularities. How is a judge to extract anything from that? How are they to decide a new case? Well, the neighbour principle is supposed to assist them in that task. So what wasn't the neighbour principle, equally importantly? Well, interestingly, it wasn't exclusive to Lord Atkin or necessarily particularly new in the law. Lord Atkin himself draws very explicitly uh, on the judgment of Master of the Rolls Brett in a case called Heaven and Pender in the 1880s. Um, pr previously to that, uh, as long ago as the 1770s, uh, a legal writer known as Francis Buller had suggested that there was a principle in the law that one should take reasonable care to avoid injuring one's neighbour. So the idea of neighbourhood itself wasn't new, but Lord Atkin was, I think, attempting to revive or utilise or make practical uh, this idea of neighbourhood as a reasoning tool for judges. Another point that he di distinctly makes in his judgement is that the neighbour principle was not designed to be a definitive rule. So here we have to distinguish between rules which, when applied, apply automatically and principles which, when applied, do not necessarily dictate any given result, but which merely assist judges in determining the outcome of a case one way or the other. Finally, it's sometimes thought that Lord Atkin's uh, neighbour principle sparked a bomb in the law of negligence, in the sense of uh, opening up the floodgates uh, to a new sphere of liability, urging the law forward to um, command results where anyone who was able to foresee harm to anybody else would automatically owe that person a legal duty of care 
such that a lapse in care would give rise to legal liability. Now, this is a, a misconception. That was not his intention, and nor indeed was it his the immediate effect uh, of his dictum in uh, Donoghue and Stevenson. Uh, there is some evidence that later on in the, in the 20th century, in the 1960s and 1970s, people seized upon his general principle as a way of expanding the boundaries of the law of negligence. But nothing really happened in the intervening period between the 1930s and the 1960s or early 1970s. And I don't think it's fair to attribute the expansion in liability that took place in those later points in time uh, to Lord Atkin. In fact, Lord Atkin was quite clear that his principle was one based not just on the foreseeability of harm, but on the existence of close and direct relationships between individuals. To what use then did Lord Atkin put his own neighbour principle? Having used it to draw out from existing cases a general proposition, he then utilised that general proposition to help to decide the particular case before him. We went from particular instances to a general principle, from a general principle to the particular case. Applying that principle, he held, and this is the, um, uh, the ratio of the case, you might say, that manufacturers owe duties of care to consumers, but in limited circumstances. Firstly, only where they sell goods in a form where there's no possibility of them being inspected before they're used. And secondly, when they know that if reasonable care isn't used, there'll be an injury to the consumer's life or property. Only in these circumstances is the principle of foreseeability of harm to a person with whom the manufacturer is in a direct and close relationship fulfilled. Why, you may ask? Well, think once again about the facts of Donahue and Stevenson. Remember that the ginger beer in which the decomposed snail was alleged to reside uh, was a dark, opaque bottle. The point that Lord Atkin is making was that there was no point in time between the time when the bottle left the manufacturing process and the time that it was likely to be opened and drunk by a consumer when the existence of the snail might have been discovered. It was therefore foreseeable to the manufacturer that the consumer might indeed be injured by the defect in the ginger beer. Had there been an opportunity for the snail to have been spotted before it got to the consumer, then the harm would no longer be immediately foreseeable to the consumer. So the case in a way provides a nice illustration of how a general principle can be brought down into the creation of a specific rule. And the specific rule that's created here uh, illustrates and embodies the general principle. Is what Lord Atkin here did in Donahue and Stevenson unique to law? No, it's not. If you think about it, this sort of reasoning goes on in all sorts of other disciplines. Wherever a discipline is confronted by uh, a heap of individual instances which it's trying to understand, is trying to draw understanding from those instances and is then trying to formulate principles or rules or propositions which can assist in deciding how to act in the future, the same sort of processes are going on. You might think, for example, of engineering. So if a person wishes to understand the, the common principles that, that underpin a particular mechanism, they may be required to take that mechanism and to deconstruct it, to understand the principles that underlie it, to reverse engineer it, if you like drawing those principles out, those principles may then be used to create a new product. You may also draw the same analogy with biology or astronomy or behavioural science. Understanding the detail of the particular can be confusing to the intelligence unless it's interrogated in a more general way. So really what Lord Atkin was doing was nothing special, but he was doing it in a way that was special to law. He was looking at the material, the fabric of the law, the particular past cases, drawing from those past cases a more general proposition and then utilising that more general proposition to decide particular cases in the future. Thereby, he rescued us from the tyranny of individual instances and enabled us to construct a system of law or to attempt to construct a system of law that was principled, which had integrity and which was reasonably predictable. <laughs>